A guide to growing scarlet runner beans. This legume makes for a beautiful flowering plant, but they're also edible. Originating in North America, scarlet runner beans have a nutty flavor and dry easily for storage. The flowers and young green pods can also be enjoyed as a leafy green addition to salads. Bonus, the flowers attract pollinators and hummingbirds to the garden. Scarlet runner bean varieties. Black runner. This variety has intense crimson flowers and jet black seeds. Butler. The pods of this variety are stringless. Golden Sunshine. This type has chartreuse green foliage. Hammond's Dwarf. A bush type that produces earlier and smaller crops than climbing cultivars. Moonlight. A variety with white flowers and stringless pods. Painted Lady. An heirloom variety with bicolored red and pink or white flowers on a vigorous vine. The seeds are cream colored, streaked with deep brown markings. Pickwick Dwarf. A bush type that matures earlier than other varieties. Pole Star. This one has stringless pods that get up to 12 inches long, but are best when picked around 6 to 8 inches long. Scarlet Emperor. This variety produces heavy crops of long stringy pods and black and purple mottled seeds. Scarlet Runner. This variety produces burgundy and black mottled seeds. Sunset. A variety that has pink flowers. White Dutch Runner. This type has flowers and seeds that are both white in color. To start Scarlet Runner beans, first find a sunny spot with well-drained soil and enough space for a trellis or something similar. This will allow the beans to climb vertically as they grow. As well, the soil must be warm. If it's not warm enough, seeds will rot, especially if they're untreated. Their preferred soil temperature is between 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 to 32 degrees Celsius, and their ideal soil pH is between 6.0 to 6.8. The seeds are fairly large and should be planted two to three inches, five to 7.5 centimeters apart, and 1.5 inches, 3.5 centimeters deep at the base of a support. Typically, seeds will sprout in eight to 16 days, depending on their soil conditions. For transplants, the seeds can be sown about two to three weeks before the last frost by planting two seeds one inch deep in individual cell packs or containers. Then, beans can be thinned to one plant per cell or pot. The ideal air temperature for beans to grow is between 60 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 30 degrees Celsius. Pod set is often poor when temperatures are higher than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Runner beans need pollination by bees to set their seeds. So it's in the beans best interest to attract bees to the garden. It also helps to thin bean plants to be four to six inches, 10 to 15 centimeters apart once the plants are about two to three inches, two to three centimeters tall. As well, Remove all young weed seedlings by hand or with a hoe and use mulch on each side of the row to keep weed seeds from germinating. As well, it's important to keep the root zone moist by watering bean plants deeply and regularly during dry periods. As well, water beans more frequently once the pods begin to develop. Note, scarlet runner beans are legumes and can use nitrogen from the atmosphere if the seeds are inoculated with the right bacteria at planting time. This bacterial inoculant can be found at most commercial seed suppliers. Inoculants are most effective when stored in a cool, dark place and applied to seeds immediately before planting. Fertilizer. Use one cup of a complete organic fertilizer for every 10 feet of row. 
Take note though that too much nitrogen fertilizer can delay the plant's maturity and affect their pod production. If bean plants flower, but do not set pods, the cause can sometimes be a zinc deficiency. Try spraying plants with a kelp-based fertilizer and also avoid using a nitrogen fertilizer until the bean plant has developed some flowers. In most cases, the best fertilizer to use on scarlet runners has a balanced mixture of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in a ratio of 10 to 10 to 10. Mulch. A thick layer of mulch will help keep the soil moist between watering. Organic material like straw, hay, or grass clippings can all be used to mulch bean plants. Harden off seedlings first before transplanting them outside and wait until after the last frost before setting transplants into the garden. Once that frost has passed and the soil has warmed to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, transplant the bean plants. Install a trellis before planting the seedlings because if it's installed after planting, there's a risk of injuring or killing the bean plants. Amaranth, beets, carrots, cucumbers, lettuce, cabbage, oregano, and corn all make great companion plants for beans. Members of the legume family, like beans, do not grow well with allium plants, like onions, garlic, shallots, or chives. Trellis. Build a strong trellis that's about six to eight feet, two to 2.5 meters tall, as bean plants will climb by twining around it. Scarlet runner bean vines will quickly and brilliantly cover fences, trellises, and other garden structures, and they can actually climb 10 to 12 feet tall. <laughs> Pretty cool. Raised beds. Till the soil to a depth of eight inches to get it loose and aerated. Add a layer of compost about two to four inches deep over the garden area, then mix it into the soil thoroughly using a garden hoe. Cell trays or containers. The cell trays or containers being used should have drainage holes. Cell trays allow bean plants to better develop their root system, which is important for their growth. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days for about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Army worms. Army worms are green, reddish, or black caterpillars that heavily feed on the leaves of plants, turning them into skeleton leaves, 
that are filled with lots of irregular or circular shaped holes. These pests are most active in the early morning and the late evening, which are the best times to check for damage. Here's what to do. You can use natural enemies like wasps and flies to help keep army worms in check. Also, if you're using insecticides, it's best to do so in the twilight hours. This is when those insecticides will be the most effective. It's also important to control the growth of weeds because they serve as cover for army worms. Finally, you can simply hand pick any army worms off the plants. Corn earworm. Its larvae will damage leaves, as well as most other parts of a plant. The younger caterpillars are a creamy white color with a black head and black hairs. Here's what to do. Make sure to monitor plants for eggs and young larvae. Certain safe bacteria can be applied to control corn earworms, but keep an eye out for natural enemies, which are good bugs to have, that could be damaged by using chemicals, since these natural enemies help keep pests in check. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface, and natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Leaf miners. Leaf miners are small dark flies with triangular yellow markings that start out as yellow maggots. They feed on the leaves of a plant, creating irregular round shaped mines slash tunnels on the leaves. These mines slash tunnels are long and narrow at first, but eventually will become an irregular shaped light colored patch. This damage can stump the growth of plants and cause the leaves of plants to turn yellow and drop. In extreme cases, severely infected seedlings can also die off completely. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of these pests, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Typically, leaf miners can be removed using a stream of water in the early morning, and certain sprays are good to use too. Natural predators like ladybugs and parasitic wasps can also be attracted to keep leaf miners away. But if these pests are spotted on any plants, simply pick the bugs off and then carefully remove any damaged leaves. Insect netting can also be used to prevent leaf miners from attacking any plants. As well, keep in mind that soils should be plowed under immediately after harvest if any crops were infected with leaf miners. Mexican bean beetle. These are copper brown pests with black spots that look like large ladybugs. 
They feed on leaves, which creates irregular patches of damage on the undersides of these leaves. That damage then causes the top surface of the leaf to dry out. This will give a plant's leaves a lacy appearance. These insects can also damage flowers and small pods, which can be damaged so badly that they drop from the plant entirely. Also, sometimes these beetles can reduce the yield of crops. Here's what to do. Since damage is most severe during the summer months, consider planting early maturing bean varieties to avoid the issue. If these beetles are found on any plants, both the adults and immature beetles can be hand-picked from the plants. Also, be sure to remove the bright yellow eggs that are typically laid in clusters on the undersides of leaves. Another option to use is diametaceous earth, which contains no toxic poisons and works quickly on contact. It's a natural powdery substance made from the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures. Simply dust this diametaceous earth lightly and evenly over the crop, wherever the beetles are found. Finally, if the beetle infestation is heavy, insecticidal soaps can be applied to the leaf undersides. Alternaria leaf blight. This fungus loves warm and wet conditions, causing brown spots with yellow edges to appear on the leaves, usually the oldest leaves first of a crop. The center of these lesions will also develop gray to brown soft fungal mold eventually drying out and giving leaves a shot hole appearance. As the disease progresses, leaves will begin to curl and eventually will die and drop from the plant. This disease is common in growing areas with high temperatures and frequent rainfall. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease resistant seeds when possible and water plants from below to avoid having soil splash up onto the lower leaves of the plants. It's also helpful to water plants in the morning so that they have time to dry out during the day. In addition to watering plants from below, it's also helpful to provide a well-ventilated cover for the plants to protect the plants from rain. Be sure to clean any equipment between uses to prevent the spread of bacteria and do not prune or handle plants when those plants are wet. As well, establish a crop rotation and stick to it. If there are any blighty leaves present, usually on the bottom of the plant closest to the soil, remove and destroy them. Finally, plant leaves can be sprayed with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and one teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water, or neem oil. Just take care not to use neem oil when pollinating insects, like bees or other beneficial insects are present. Spray only a few leaves to start, then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Anthracnose. Small water-soaked spots will appear on a plant's leaves, and eventually those spots will get bigger and turn tan or brown in color with a papery texture. This disease thrives in extremely wet weather, and its spores are usually spread by splashing water. It can grow on any part of a plant, except for on the plant's roots. Here's what to do. Plant disease-resistant seeds when possible, and practice good crop rotation. In general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. As well, avoid using sprinklers or overhead irrigation and water plants from their base to keep leaves as dry as possible. As well, seeds can be treated with hot water prior to planting, 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius for 25 minutes. If anthracnose is found on any plants, make sure to destroy and compost the crop residue after harvest. As well, Make sure to follow recommended spacing guidelines, since air circulation and ventilation is important for avoiding a lot of diseases. Finally, when planting in containers, it's important to sterilize those containers before use. Bacterial blight. A disease that causes water-soaked spots to appear on leaves. 
those spots will grow and turn brown while also being surrounded in yellow. And when the lesions come together, plants develop a burned appearance. At this point, any leaves that die will remain attached to the plant. Bacterial blight will also stunt the growth of plants, and it can be spread by water, wind, animals, or people. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease-free seeds when possible and practice good crop rotation. Use drip watering methods or any watering method that focuses on only watering the base of the plant. Avoid splashing water onto plants and make sure the plant leaves are kept nice and dry. As well, ensure good ventilation and air movement by spacing plants properly. This will also help reduce any humidity around those plants. It's also important to control the growth of any nearby weeds. Another thing that can be done to avoid disease is to treat seeds with an antibiotic before planting to kill off the bacteria. Finally, spray plants with a protective copper-based fungicide before any disease symptoms appear. Bean rust. Initially, small yellow slash white spots will appear on the leaves of a plant. Those spots will then grow and develop raised red rust pustules which are gross pimple-like growths. If the disease is severe, it can cause plants to drop their leaves prematurely. Here's what to do. Water beans in the early morning hours to give plants time to dry out during the day. Drip watering and soaker hoses can also be used to help keep leaves dry, but overhead sprinklers should be avoided. As well, use a slow-release organic fertilizer on crops and avoid excess nitrogen. Prune or stake plants and remove any weeds to improve the air circulation around the plants. Make sure to disinfect any pruning tools, one part bleach to four parts water, after each cut. Finally, use a thick layer of mulch or organic compost to cover the soil after the soil has been raked and cleaned because mulch will prevent the bean rust disease spores from splashing back up onto the plant's leaves. Root rot. A fungal disease that causes plants to become limp, while any terminal leaves, those at the tips of stems, as well as the stems will die off. This is because the roots are no longer able to absorb and move nutrients and water to the rest of the plant. Typically, the lower leaves of an affected plant will turn yellow. Gray, black, or red lesions will also appear on the lower stems and roots. Root rots can affect both seedlings and mature plants. Here's what to do. Plant crops in well-draining soil and water sparingly, allowing the soil to dry before watering. In general, watering once every one to two weeks is enough but this amount might need to be adjusted to suit the local climate. Also, practice crop rotation and avoid using too much nitrogen in the soil. If a plant has root rot already, dig up the plant and prune out any infected roots, then dust the roots with fungicide powder. If the entire root system is black and mushy, then the entire plant should be destroyed. Damping off. This is one of the most common problems when starting plants from seed. Seedlings will emerge and appear healthy, then suddenly they'll wilt and die for no obvious reason. Damping off is caused by a fungus that thrives in moist conditions, and when soil and air temperatures are above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It can also thrive when soils have too much nitrogen fertilizer, this fungus favors slow-growing, deeply-seeded plants. The stems of affected plants become water-soaked and will eventually collapse, while roots become too water-soaked and damaged to function. Older plants can also be affected, and either those older plants become stunted or they will collapse. Damping off can be spread three different ways, either in water, by contaminated soil, or on gardening equipment. Here's what to do. When possible, plant disease-free seeds. Keep seedlings moist, 
but avoid overwatering the seedlings to keep the soil from getting too wet. And try to keep the soil from getting too cold. Raised beds are usually a great option for planting, since raised beds help with drainage. Also, avoid over-fertilizing seedlings and thin the seedlings out to avoid overcrowding and to make sure the seedlings are getting good air circulation. If containers are being used, those containers should be thoroughly washed in soapy water and then rinsed in a 10% bleach solution after each use. If any plants are affected with damping off, remove them from the garden and then practice a crop rotation of two to three years. Slerotinia rot, aka white mold. A fungal disease that causes cotton-like white mold to form on infected plants. Irregular gray water-soaked lesions will appear on the leaves, while white-gray lesions appear on the plant stems. Sometimes the leaves and branches will also turn slimy. During warm and humid weather, plants are often completely destroyed. This fungus can survive in the soil for more than five years, and it is spread by wind, contaminated water, and by infected seeds. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice proper crop rotation and keep planting beds well drained. Also, add aged compost, avoid overhead watering, and keep the garden free of debris and weeds. It also helps to avoid using excessive nitrogen fertilizer and to also keep rows spaced widely apart. If white mold is found on any plants, potassium bicarbonate is a safe, effective fungicide that kills spores on contact. Like baking soda, potassium bicarbonate is also a great preventative treatment because it raises the pH level of soil above 8.3, an alkaline environment that isn't ideal for fungus to grow. Simply mix three tablespoons of potassium bicarbonate, three tablespoons vegetable oil, and one half teaspoon of soap together into a gallon of water. Then spray it onto the affected plants. Baking soda itself has a high pH of nine, so it can also help to raise the pH level of soil for plants. And the baking soda creates a very alkaline environment that kills the fungus. Typically though, baking soda is best used as a preventative treatment rather than a fungicide. Mix one tablespoon of baking soda and a half teaspoon liquid hand soap with one gallon of water. Then spray the solution on affected leaves, but don't apply it during daylight hours. It might also be best to test one or two leaves first to see if it causes sunburn to the plants. In general though, as soon as diseased plants are noticed, those plants should be destroyed immediately. If the soil is infected, Try to remove as much of it as possible and then replace it with clean soil. Barriers like plastic or mulch can also be used to cover the infected ground and prevent the spread of the disease. If possible, it's also important to remove all crop residue after harvesting. This disease can survive and develop if residue is left behind. And since white mold spores are long lasting, the spores could survive the winter in this residue, if given the chance. Harvesting. The edible beans grow up to a foot long and are especially good when they're picked young. As well, beans can be picked often to promote continued flowering. Beans can be picked once they're plump looking. The pods should be tender and break easily with a snap when ready. Beans can either be dried to preserve them or they can be cooked soon after harvesting. Important, cook these beans thoroughly. Raw runner beans contain lectin, which is a toxin that's removed by the cooking process. Storage. Beans can be stored in a perforated plastic bag in the fridge for up to a week. Beans also freeze really well. Simply clean the beans, trim their ends, and snap them. Blanch for one minute in boiling water, then plunge into ice water for another minute, then drain them thoroughly before sticking them in the freezer.